engineers love really complex things. They love stressing their brains to the limits of their cognitive capacity because smart people don't get to exercise their full cognitive capacity that often. And so it's a lot of fun when they do. The problem is you don't notice when you go beyond your cognitive capacity. And so it's really good to engage with problems that innately to the problem challenge you to, to use a fair amount, but excess capacity is the problem. Yeah? I mean, usually I, I know when I just like, feel frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> you feel <laughs> Yeah, you can sometimes tell, but feel frustrated, especially if it's one like stress or multitasking where you feel like something outside is constraining you. Um, but some other sources of cognitive load, um, especially in code that people won't think of. Um, illegibility. If code is hard to read and hard to interpret, then, uh, then that just makes it harder to deal with. And people will spend cycles on that rather than having those cycles available to, to solve the problem. Um, complexity is another one, just raw complexity of a particular piece of code. Um, the interesting thing is that the data tend to bear this out. Um, if you go look at bugs um, and how they correlate with sections of code, um, bugs arise in a section of code um, in a super linear fashion with combinatorial complexity of that code. So as combinatorial complexity of the function increases, the number of bugs that happen in that, uh, that are traced back to that function over time increases super linearly. Same with just raw length of the function. Um, there are some uh, things that have shown that various sources of illegibility uh, will also strongly correlate. Uh, there's a study that I can no longer find um, that was uh, showing that uh, differences in white space, um, if indentation didn't actually match the, uh, uh, the real scoping, um, had a greater impact on bugs than most anything else. Was a dramatic, you know, just because it was hard to read, and people would make errors in, in assessing what was going on. Um, <coughs> so that's most of the first conversation. Is bugs come from mistakes? Mistakes come from exceeding our cognitive load or exceeding our cognitive capacity when something is too hard. Um, and it's not that it's beyond. It's not necessarily that the core problem is beyond us. Um, it's that the total set of thinking about it, including the context and the solution that's already there, is more than we can keep in our brains at once. Some part of it gets forgotten, and we make a mistake because we make the decision based only off what's available. I think part of the piece that makes that worse is that we think we have it on our head yep. while it's happening. Yes. And we have a bit of hubris in our profession. So. Um, not just in our profession. Actually, the neuroscience bears it out. Um, one of the nice, nice things about what you see is all there is, um, is that it is uh, completely invisible to the person who has that experience. Um, and all humans have that same cognitive fallacy, and every single one of them thinks they're making a decision based on all the information, and then they don't. <laughs> and it's just really, really consistent. Um, and you can, uh, there's a lot of really good neuroscience research on that that's uh, fascinating to read. Um, so, let's go to the next one. What makes code hard to unit test? Rails. <laughs> Rails. <laughs> <laughs> the last couple weeks, definitely. When it's, when it's written before, or when you, uh, you write it before you write your test. So, when the code exists before the test, what facets of that make it hard to test? Dependencies. Dependencies? Okay. Other stuff? When it does too many things. Okay? Other stuff? Global variables. Global variables. <laughs> yeah, which is a really bad case of dependencies. <laughs> Other stuff? Other things that makes. Reliance on database data? On database data? So yeah. that can be a couple of different things. It could be a global dependency. Um, yeah. It can also be a latency issue. Um, it could be a hard to inject values sorts of issue. Yeah. yeah. All of those. All those. Or some other things. Yeah. When, in this, for, for the sake of, of testability, the, the, the tests miss the point of the original project. <laughs> <laughs> so when, uh, for the, when I change the code to make it testable so far that it doesn't actually do what it was supposed to do? Uh, the, the, the tests are brilliant and the software doesn't work. Okay, <laughs> they check something along the side. Yeah, so I, I just missed the point. Okay, so I don't know that that necessarily made it hard, the code hard to test, I just didn't test it right. 
But what are some other ones that make the code hard to test? Yeah. Yeah, the feedback cycle is too long. Um, so I can't, I have to think about things and keep it in mind for too long. Yeah. Other things that make the code hard to test? Was written by someone else and poorly written, was poorly written? Written by someone else, poorly written, hard to understand? Yeah, Okay. Mocking. Mocking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly won't get me to disagree with that one. Um, <laughs> So yeah, other things that make the code hard to test. Hit most of them. Okay. So let's turn this on its head. Um, what are some things that we can do with code to make it easy to test? How do we transform code to make it <coughs> easily testable and easily specifiable? Make it smaller. Make it smaller. Single responsibility. Single responsibility. <laughs> All the solid stuff. Yeah. Pseudocode. <laughs> Pseudocode? Yeah. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is just having actually a plan drawn up in a human readable language that individuals on your team can all understand versus a defined actual programming language. Like, I don't know Rails, but I know human language and I know C++. So if you say, hey, go implement that. Draw it up in some form of pseudocode, so we both agree what I've developed in. Okay, so having a common a common language with the other people on your team. Yes. So that could be a pseudocode, or that could be the code, Correct. depending on whether you have to. Correct. So a common language. Yeah. So, yeah. Designed for testability. They do it in hardware. <laughs> Very successful. Designed for testability. And what do you mean by that? Because there are a bunch of. I mean, this whole thing is how do you design for testability? So where's the general? So making it so I can so I can inject the the inputs and easily read the outputs and, and even internals yeah in the data. yeah so in the software world that ends up being a couple of things one uh, reducing coupling so that I can test each part in isolation um, which is a lot easier to do in software than in hardware because I can't just pick a portion of the chip pop it in and poke at it. Um, and the other is uh, separating uh, CQRS, separating commanding um, and querying, so that uh, no function um, both sets values and gives returns. Um, so uh, we've hit most of them. Another big one that's important if you want to make these success, make it legible. Give great names to things. Yeah. Architectural principle and the way it applies at the level of a single function. Um, the key idea is that um, we control the direction of data flows, and we don't have systems in which we push data in, they have effects, and we get the data out. Um, we simplify it so that either um, a thing has an effect or it uh, uh, gives us an answer. Um, and so that's the same. That's the same concept whether you're applying it at the architectural level or at the level of a single function. And that makes it easier to test because um, the limit, uh, because I can easily identify what are the possible scope of all effects of a given function or a given whatever I'm looking at. Does that clarify? Sure. Okay. Um, so all of these things make code easy to test. Right? If we have clear, uh, clear requirements, simple requirements, single responsibility, um, Legibility, great names. Um, we don't mix reads and writes, the, the uh, uh, separation of, of commanding and query. Um, and then other things, encapsulating uh, non-determinism, encapsulating de delays, encapsulating those sorts of, of complexities. So that's the second time.
So, interesting. What's similar between the lists of the ends of these two talks? Human. What do you notice about it? Humans. Yeah. <clears throat> Simplifying the complexity of things. Well, limiting the perspective that you're considering at the moment so that you reduce the amount that you have to think about it. Okay. Uh, I heard you say eliminating the perspective, no, but limiting. limiting. Okay. Limiting okay. Yeah. <laughs> that makes more sense to me. Like yes. <laughs> so limiting the scope of what you have to look yeah. at at any given moment. Um, yeah. Uh, in fact, if you look at it, all of the problems that cause high cognitive load uh, the solution for it appeared on the second list. Making code easier to test requires that you do the same things that reduce cognitive load when you're working with that code. Well, you get a bump under the rug problem with some of those tactics. <laughs> yes, if you keep shoving it around. Yeah. Um, so the question is then, yeah, can you design a system such that I actually am fragmenting off complexity each time that I do this? I'm not just shoving it around, but I'm really fragmenting it off. Um, okay, well that's interesting. Full value pad. What's the purpose of full value pad? Somebody want to uh, repeat that for us? So a full value pattern um, is, uh, it's the cure for primitive obsession. So primitive obsession is Canonically, I'm using some primitive in a system where a type would work. Um, I'm tr talking about money and I pass it around as a double rather than as a currency object of type dollar. Mm -hmm. right? um, and whole value pattern is, is the, the reverse of that. It's that when I'm talking about money, I'm passing you either a dollar object with some value or a yen object with some value okay. or a whatever it is. Right? When I'm talking about time, I hand you a clock. I don't hand you a timestamp or a double, I hand you a clock. <laughs> right? um, so whole value is this, uh, this concept of taking every concept in the system and reifying it and putting it somewhere. Interesting effect of applying whole value to a system. If I look at some big, nasty, gnarly, ugly section of code and I start just taking chunks off of it, then I can very easily end up pushing, pushing the uh, bump around under the rug. But if instead of taking arbitrary chunks off, I take out concepts, then that section of the code was dealing with some number of concepts at a time. And if I grab all the parts that are related to that concept and put them in one place, I'm actually extracting pieces of complexity with every, every extraction. And I will end up with some amount of residual complexity that's the interaction between those concepts. And often, that's where you make the big step in your domain and you realize that that interaction is itself a concept. Um, sometimes you don't make that first, and you just made the problem smaller. And sometimes, and then you come back to it and you finally realize that missing concept. Oh, pricing is a valuable thing. And it's a separate concept from stock and trading. There's also a pricing, and I need to pass pricing, the knowledge of pricing. So that's whole value problem. That's how you break apart a, or whole value pattern. That's how you can break apart a system in a way that you're actually tearing off chunks of complexity as you go along. So the interesting thing about those those two lists are that driving code to be unit testable reduces the cognitive load necessary to deal with it. Now, cognitive load was the source of most of the defects. Now, it won't drive it to zero because there is a central cognitive load in your, in your domain. There is complexity in your domain, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. And that's fine. That's a good thing. Um, but it gets rid of all of the unessential cognitive load. So you're getting down to just what's actually required to deal with the problems in your domain. And this is why unit testing does, uh, reduces bugs. So unit testing, the process of, do, of writing unit tests, doesn't find bugs. I mean, you don't find a defect when you write a unit test. Once in a while, if you're doing tests first, you'll write a test, and then you'll write the code, and oh, I made a mistake, the test found it, I fixed it. But that's not the bug that unit testing is protecting you against. Because if you count all of those up that happen over time, it's nowhere near the number of defects that your team was writing every week before you started unit testing. The ones that it got rid of is, are the ones that it prevented because it simplified the cognitive load. Now that only happens if you do unit testing as a design technique. If you're using unit testing as a feedback system 
to actually change your design to reduce the cognitive load necessary to deal with it. We, the way we drive bugs down with TBD is not in the test step, it's in the refactor step. And it doesn't kill a bug now, it kills a bug the next time that I have to look at this code three seconds from now. It reduces my complexity thinking about it in the future. Now, that's only true. <clears throat> the problem with, with making design changes is we're making a design impact and change. What's the probability of introducing a defect while well, making that change? Right? Traditional ways of working, um, the probability of introducing a defect while making a design impact and change is higher than that while making a non-design impact and change. If I'm building the code in the way that the design and God intended, <clears throat> then it extends easily and I work. And if I go against the current design and I'm trying to change the design, then I have a much higher chance of introducing a bug. Yeah. How do you separate the two, design impacting versus non <coughs> um, If your system has really good existing design and is, is well factored, it's very hard to separate the two. Um, however, if you're in a system that's really big and arcane and complex and has a whole bunch of legacy code, um, then usually it's pretty easy to tell because there will be obvious extension points. Um, you'll have a very large method that takes two objects as, as uh, arguments, one of which is a strategy for doing X. So you can add a new strategy for doing X if you want, but if you want to change how it does Y, God help you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the nastier the code is, the more obvious it becomes how different those can be. Um, so the interesting thing is what happens if you can reduce the probability of introducing a bug while changing the design? And this is what sci the science of refactoring is. So a lot of people, when they talk about refactoring, what they talk about is take a small section of the code and write it differently. That's not refactoring. That's rewrite. Many rewrites, it's local rewrites, it's less risky than other rewrites, but it's a product rewrite. Refactoring is executing a design change using only a sequence of named, known good code transformations. So I can do extract method, I can do introduce parameter, I can do introduce field. I cannot type code. The nice thing about these, the named refactorings is they can be statically analyzed and demonstrated, and in fact done by a tool, um, and demonstrated that they do not alter behavior of code at all. They are bug for bug compatible with whatever was there before. All your previous bugs existed, no new ones were added. Which is exactly what I want. Right? Especially when I'm at Microsoft and we care about backwards compatibility, so we love and cherish our bugs and we want to keep them. <laughs> um, because our customers love and cherish many of our bugs and they want to keep them. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so what do you do when you don't have good tools? Well, that sucks, first of all. Uh, this is, by the way, why, um, although I did enjoy dynamic languages for a little while, I have left them. Um, because they let me down on tooling. Uh, I just can't build the tooling that I need in order to do my job well. Um, I'm a lot slower uh, in development, and I write more bugs when I'm using dynamic language than a static language because the tool can't support me as well. Right. Um, now, if I've got a really good type inference language, that's statically typed. I just didn't have to tell it all the types. That's even better. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so tooling really helps. Now, tooling is not required. Um, if you go look in the original refactoring book by, uh, by Fowler, or in refactoring.com, or in Michael Feather's Working Effectively Legacy Code, they've got a number of recipes for a lot of these things. Um, most of them for C or Java, um, but most of those apply for many other languages as well, because there are a few things that have more oddities than C. Um, and if you go, and those have a process whereby you make a particular change, and then you lean on the compiler, because this is guaranteed to turn anything that would have caused a problem and not been safe into a compiler error. And so you see whether you have any of those. And you keep going and you go back and forth and that sort of stuff. Um, when you go out of statically compiled languages to dynamic execution, then it gets harder again. Um, and uh, when you get to Python, Ruby, and JavaScript, you're actually fairly limited. Um, and it becomes very, very difficult to be doing known safe transformations. Um, which makes the cost of maintenance on the, or the probability of introducing a defect while doing maintenance on those languages go up. And that's just sort of part of life of being in those languages. You get to write stuff faster at first, and you get to pay a little more to maintain it afterwards. It's a reasonable, it's a trade-off. Um, once you get good at refactoring, um, however, 
you know, if you learn it in a language in which you've got all the tool support, so you're only doing the things that the tools enable, then even if you're in a language where there's no tool support and you can't lean on a compiler, if you were really in the habit of, I'm going to do an extract method followed by an introduce parameter followed by an extract class here, um, you are much less likely to make the mistake, even if you execute all of those by hand without tool support, than if you say, I just need to move some of this into its own method and adjust the data and I'll do a little rewrite. Um, so there is, that depends a lot on the test. Um, tests tend to lock in a particular, particular facets of the design. Um, they lock in both the, uh, uh, the, what the code does and a little bit of how I assess that. Um, and so depending on exactly how I wrote my tests, um, I may or may not have to actually make some change in how I inject data as I change, make a refactoring. And that can invalidate some of the tests that would have protected me. Also, it's really difficult to have that many tests that can, can achieve that level of coverage, especially if I'm far enough out that I can refactor inside my tests without causing those problems, <coughs> then now I get bit by combinatorial testing complexity, um, which makes it really hard to have the number. Um, you can do it with, with test coverage, and that is the way that you do it in dynamic languages. Um, it certainly helps and it reduces the risk, um, but it doesn't get it to the point where a design impacting change has the same probability of error as a non-design impacting change. It gets lower, but it's not the same. And there's a magic point when design change is free. When making a design change has the same risk as not making a design change, then now I no longer ever make a trade-off about would I change my design. Because of course I change my design. If I change my design, I can reduce cognitive load and prevent future bugs, and I have a 0% probability of introducing a bug now, so obviously I change my design. If I've got a probability of introducing a bug and it making, making it past my tests, for whatever reasons, then I have to, I have to make that trade-off um, to be a professional. Um, I have to choose, well, there's a low non-zero chance of introducing a bug now, and if I leave it, there's a pretty good chance I'll introduce a bug later. So what's the cost trade-off of a future bug versus a probability of a current bug? If you can't get that low enough, then you might almost always make the design change, but still, if you can get it to zero, which you can with name of your factorings, then you just are completely free on design. And you change it whenever you want, however you want. That's the magic of the refactor. So, in conclusion. Um, this is why I hold that the key skill of unit testing and TDD has nothing to do with testing, it's refactoring. Um, and in fact, uh, a fun story, Corey Haynes does uh, every year or two, every year or so, um, he does a project wherein he uh, does not write any tests. Um, he does, it's his test-free project. Um, and he does this every year, and he will do many projects in a year or so. Uh, but um, an interesting thing he finds is that the design of that project and its defect rate is almost exactly the same as the project that he wrote right before it in which he did full, t full TDD. He got the same bug rate with zero tests as he did with full TDD and full test coverage, even over an extended period of time. There's some of these for, for multiple weeks or months into the time period where unit testing pays off. Um, and what he finds is the difference is that because he knows how to refactor and he knows how to design, um, he's not creating those bugs and he's not introducing those bugs when he makes refactorings. Um, the project after the one in which he doesn't do the unit testing, where he then does unit testing again, he gets, once again, his steadily monotonically decreasing rate of bugs and, and uh, decreasing costs. Um, so what he posits is that, I'll get to that, um, what he posits is that unit testing has nothing to do with elimination, eliminating bugs. The purpose of unit testing is to train your ability at design. Design fixes the bugs. All right, you and the deal. Uh, I think that works out for a single person working on a single project, but when you enter in two or more people, that may be true, and I don't have data either to support or deny. <laughs> um, there is certainly a strong value of testing in terms of specification and sharing the spec around. Uh, 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 resolving that communication issue eliminates bugs. I would expect 
a lot of those to appear if I didn't have the tests and I had multiple people, for example. Every factor, and I do want to state that I'm not against dynamic languages. I think they have a very good, cho uh, a very good role. In fact, I use them a lot. Um, it's that uh, dynamic languages reduce your upfront costs while increasing the maintenance, the ongoing maintenance, um, and that's and and they can. If you are talking a high-level dynamic language where I have to write, I don't have to write as much code versus a low-level static language where I have to write a heck of a lot more code. Well, size is also strongly correlated with bugs, so you'll have fewer bugs in the smaller code base. Um, that's also a huge advantage. And it turns out most of the dynamic languages are higher level, so that can totally uh, uh, result, that can be a complete win for you. Um, but I will always prefer a high level static language with tool support to a high level dynamic language without it uh, because of the maintenance cost. Um, so yeah. Uh, the, the key to this whole set of talks, um, unit testing doesn't really find bugs. That's not its point. The commonly we see a lot of arguments with people of, you know, why should I unit test if it doesn't find bugs? Well, no, it doesn't. That's, a, that's just fine. It's not its point. Uh, unit testing informs refactoring. It tells you when something is hard to test. When something is hard to test, it has the characteristics that will lead to high cognitive load to work with it. If it has high cognitive load to work with it, Devs will make mistakes and they will introduce bugs in the future. Right? So unit testing is your earliest warning that you are about to create code that will cause someone else to write a bug later. Um, and then refactoring um, is, uh, to a unit verifiable design is what eliminates the bugs. By refactoring to a design that is easy to test, I've now reduced the cognitive load required to deal with it again to the point that future developers won't make the bugs. So if you really want to eliminate bugs, don't focus on finding them, don't focus on fixing them, and don't focus on testing. Focus on ease. Make the code easy to deal with and refactor it until it's clean. So that's that sequence of talks. I'm going to change gears here a bit and talk about fluency. So, um, Agile Fluency Model, how many people have uh, seen it? The main one, okay. Great, so um, this is a model that Jim Shore and Diana Larson put together um, to talk about um, Agile teams. And they were trying to, they were noticing that there are teams that are qualitatively different from each other. Um, and they wanted to figure out why and how. Um, let me see, okay. okay, so this isn't their model. So um, they were trying to establish why are these teams different from each other. Um, and so they just looked at a whole bunch of teams and started clustering them into sets that were the same. And they found there were basically four, they called them levels of Agile teams. Um, and um, there were ones that, uh, the first level was they talk about customer value. They talk about the product in terms of customer value. Um, so basically means they use stories. <laughs> Rather than talking about architectural components and making programmer tasks, they use stories to talk about what they're going to do. The next level beyond that is release at will, two star. Um, this is that the code is always in a clean enough state and never has any bug, uh, has bugs, such that they can release on the market cadence at all times sustainably forever, whatever that market cadence is. Um, so the first star, um, Scrum is a process that pretty much always gives you a one star result, because um, it gives you what is necessary to talk in terms of customer value and the whole team aligned with that. Um, but it doesn't give you what's necessary to give you two-star. You know, XP gives you what's necessary to give you two-star. It has the technical practices that allow you to deliver on that. The third star is optimized customer value. So three-star uh, means that you are not just speaking in terms of customer value, but you're assessing it in some way, and you're continually modifying what you do and what your system does to increase customer value. Lean startup is an example of the three-star process. Okay. And you can't really get that until you have the second star, because the second star is what gives you a stable ability to measure. I can release whenever I want, and my released code doesn't have very many bugs in it. So therefore, when I make an assessment, it's actually a valid assessment. You know, 
I don't have an A-B test where there's a bug on path A and not on path B, right, which would invalidate my data. Um, so uh, three star, again, depends on two star, just like two sort of depends on one. And that gives three star. And then four star is the magical unicorn. Uh, <laughs> it's really ill-defined. Um, and uh, they're currently defining, you know, they're currently talking about is it's, it's some sort of a culturally agile thing. It's optimized the organization continuously. Um, and the, they've got, they, they would say that Valve, for example, is a company that is aspiring to and is sort of working towards it. And there are a few others that are where um, on the basis of data of how well teams do, they completely transform the organizational structure and continually are, are adapting the company in that way. Semco might be a good example of a four-star mm -hmm. agile company. Um, these are really rare and no one's, no one has even really defined that subject. So it's, it's sort of the first three stars are the ones that people are aiming at. Hmm. WL Gore, maybe? Gore, maybe. They, I think they talked about Gore as being a strong three star, and but not really four star because they've got a mechanism that they do, but they don't inspect and adapt that mechanism and change it. Hmm. So they don't have data that proves that their mechanism is good, but could be improved by 5% if they change the company size down by 20 or something like that. Hmm. Right? So. Uh, so, uh, the, so fluency model, pretty good. Um, the other really nice thing about it is that it separates proficiency from fluency. This is its biggest idea. Um, so it doesn't matter what your team does in the good days. It doesn't matter what your team is capable of. The results you get are what, the, what happens when the chips are down. Um, and you can look at this, and you can see this really obviously in the technical practices. So. Um, if I have a team that on its good days writes unit tests and refactors and works in pairs and that sort of stuff, and then when there's a live site issue, the way we do that is we everyone goes, holy crap, and we split up into a bunch of individuals who all massively bug things to try and get something out as quickly as possible and slap it on the site. What does our code look like? If I execute that for very long, it will result in code that almost that looks very, very similar to a code that uh, to, to the code of a team that always does the slapdash code, and not at all like a team that always does TDD. It matters what you do when the chips are down on your worst days. What you default back to. Teams that teams that you know when life is easy they may or may not pair, but when life gets hard and it's an emergency they always pair a mob. Those are the teams that are fluent at pairing. Fluent at model. Um, so uh, the the key to the fluency model is you need to identify what level, what your target is, and you don't necessarily need to be a three-star team. In fact, there are a lot of businesses where one star is exactly the right answer. But you need to identify what you want, and you need to get absolutely fluent at that. And it doesn't matter what you do when life is going well; it matters what you do when things are smooth. So I built on their sort of thing, their sort of model, and identified that most teams seem to need to get to the two-star level. Some teams need to go three-star. Um, some teams can get away with one, but two-star is um, a pretty strong requirement for most teams around there. I need to be able to release on the market cadence sustainably on an ongoing basis um, and not get surprised by defects all the time. Um, and so I created a model. Theirs is a nice, clean, easy model with four levels, one of which is a unicorn, so three real levels. Um, <laughs> I replaced that with a model where I double clicked on one of those and you get 100 items, or thereabouts. Um, <laughs> um, not nearly as simple. Um, where I tried to talk about what does your first two years of becoming a two star Agile team look like? What are all of the characteristic states? the teams go through, and what are the dependencies between those states? Um, and so, for example, in this section of the code, um, we have local transform-based refactoring, great names, coding units, and test units. Um, so, in order to be able to test units, I need to have units in the code. And so I need to be fluent at actually coding in terms of good units. In order to do that, I need to have great names. Great names gives me those concepts, and I start implementing whole value pattern. That's what I, a lot of what I'm learning at right there. Right? So, uh, in a sense, this sequence here is teaching me the second of the simple rules. 
Um, it's teaching me everything has a, a, a single clear purpose uh, and is named accordingly. Um, and then um, I also need to you know, learn not to repeat myself and that sort of stuff as I continue out. But down here, this is a level that most people forget. Automated developer testing. Right? They forget that and forget to celebrate. There is tremendous value in having devs write tests that suck. <laughs> right? When teams are just getting started, um, often uh, people will come in and do a TDD training and they'll teach you red, green, refactor, red, green, refactor. And you want to write some bad code and then you want to make it, uh, uh, you want to make the test, or you want to make a, a bad test and then bad code and then you'll refactor and make it good. And the response that everyone gives is, why would I write bad code? I can see the good code, why would I write the bad one? Um, and at that point, that's correct because you don't have the refactoring knowledge to build up front. Uh, to, to be able to change the design as quickly and easily as you could do it right. So, in fact, I put the red-green refactor in a loop way out here um, in this eliminate that and change the rules later stage. Um, so, first thing I'll tell, help a team with is how do I just write a damn test and get in the habit of writing tests all the time? No matter what I'm doing, I always write a test. Before the, before the code, after the code, don't care. Once we've got that habit established, okay, now how do I get you to write the test before the code every time? Right. And what's the value of doing that? The thing is, each one of these by itself provides some value. Just writing the tests provides some value. Now, functionality, uh, functional quality can be owned by devs. Right? It's no longer split between roles. So you have clear responsibility for who should deal with bugs. Well, dev. They should, they should not write them, and then they should find the ones they write, and then they should fix them. <laughs> it's all in depth. Um, and then writing test first, now the test becomes the spec. That's the big change that happens there. Once I start to write the test first, it starts changing the way that I think about the test. And it starts driving me to write legible tests because they become the spec in the communication vehicle for deciding what to do. And so on. And so there's this whole huge network that teams go through. Um, and now I just want to open up for and ask me anything. Um, I'm willing to talk about basically anything for the first couple of years of agile development. Yeah. So are you asserting also that this is the quickest path to fluency, or is this just what you observe? I what mostly this is what I observe in terms of uh, the the skills that teams need to learn. Um, I do find often, for example, that a team will start with trying to do red green refactor, and they'll sit there on that, and they'll churn on it for several months. Um, and they'll get to it at somewhere around three months. Um, they'll, it'll finally click. And when I look closely, what they were doing was failing at it while building up the other skills. And they went through this sequence of other skills. And they actually got through this sequence of other skills at about the same rate as the group that was intentionally building them. But they had a lot more frustration along the way. <laughs> 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 yeah, so it's mostly observational, but um, I do find, and the other thing that I find is that um, where there isn't a dependency, you can learn those in parallel. And often people will try and avoid boiling the ocean by taking on, well, we're going to do TV first, and we're not going to do anything else. You know, we're not going to do the pair programming or whatever else. And that means that they are sitting on the end of this long dependency chain trying to churn their way up along it and only hitting other things as they become obvious dependencies. Where they could be, instead of trying to go for this really hard sequence that's all mutually dependent, they could do, which is like eight different things, they could do eight things that don't depend on each other in parallel at once and get them all done. Right, and then go on to the next one. Yeah. What sort of organization lets you keep a team together for two years until it gels? <laughs> <laughs> so you will notice, way over here on the left, Work as a team. <laughs> the thing that I would say separates uh, traditional software done well from agile development at all, so done poorly with an opportunity to do well, is whether you work as a team or work as a bunch of individuals. Um, I've developed a really good way to, to identify the difference between a work group and a team. Um, and it's uh, a single question. So as you enter the space, people will answer it uh, answer with one of the two answers, and as you exit the space, they will answer with the other answer. That's the, they've changed and are working as team. 
that question is you go ask the, the manager or his manager, and you say, okay, you've got, you've got some work you need to get done. High priority and important work. You've got two options. One, you can give it to your second best person, because your best person is, of course, already occupied, because they're all talking to you. But you can give it to your second best person um, as their task, and they'll go away and get it done. Okay. Or you can grab a group of eight people and say to that eight people, it's your charter, make it happen. Which one of these scares you more? Because if you don't have a team, if you've got a work group, a set of people that work as individuals, um, and are unable to come together and actually have team accountability, then your only option is individual accountability. And it's what you do, because going to that group of people, that would be a work group, and that's no accountability. And that would suck. If you've got a team, you have the option of having actual team-based accountability. And when you have that option, then, well, of course I would assign it to the team because assigning it to an individual, there's too many chances of blocking, there's too many chances of overwork, of siloing, and all these other risks, and that would suck. So that's this first transition, and that is organizational. Um, and when I'm working with a group, that's the first thing that I work on. Um, so yeah, usually when I go into a group, they would not uh, consider leaving uh, people together for, for that long. I'm coming from Microsoft, they sort of like the reorg. Um, <laughs> but um, we work on that with the team and with managers, and they see the value of it. And once we've established that, and they see how team accountability gives them new options for getting work done, and for continually improving as a team, it enables all that continual improvement, then they convert. Yeah. So I think if I could greatly simplify, one of the assertions that you were making earlier was that uh, testability has some correlation with a lower cognitive load some beneficial aspects. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the hoopla that's been uh, out there about things like TDD uh, influencing the design of your application poorly or, or destroying the application's design. Yeah, yes I can. Um, <laughs> so I guess one of the ways that I phrased it internally, I don't know if we go ahead and phrase it this way. Um, is uh, there are a lot of web frameworks out there. Um, and uh, I've, I've seen a number of them, and I've worked in a number of them. And some of them are significantly more well-designed than others, and easier to put my code in, and easier to work with, and faster to work with. And it turns out the ones that are testable are the ones that don't have controllers. They have very strong models, uh, very strong model development, and, and then MVVM style, where the view and the model exchange only data, not function. Like, I don't have execution paths that go between them, I just have data share. Um, and so I would state that the, uh, the people who designed some of these web frameworks have a lot to learn about design. Um, and I would not follow their design instincts as I have found them to be uh, inferior to those that other web frameworks have chosen. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> that was very diplomatic. <laughs> how to do it in some of the other cases afterwards. But in my case, um, I'm in a long-standing company um, that has a lot of code, um, a couple billion lines of code in the company, like a lot of code. And we know what it costs to do development, and we know what ratios go into what, and so on. And so uh, when you ask any of the managers, the product managers, the dev managers, any of those, so you're going to do a, a new release of your product, um, you, what portion of your total development cycle do you get to plan for? You just divide it up. There's some amount of your work that you get to do on planned work that's strategic, and there's some amount that is stabilization period, overhead, um, going through legal compliance, um, recovering from all the mistakes that were caused by the planned work, unexpected things that came up because it took so long, your cycles aligned so long, so on. What's the ratio? Um, 
and pretty universally around the company, one sixth of the work gets to be on target. Five sixths is the other stuff. So, uh, so what I'm saying when we're when I'm proposing that we're going to do some of these uh, uh, these, these trade-offs to actually spend something to reduce maintenance, is I'm going to say that maybe if you spend one sixth of your stuff on planned work and one sixth of your stuff on paying down technical debt, then you only need to spend three sixths of your time on the ongoing maintenance on this project, and so you move the deadline in by a sixth, and next time you'll only need to spend half as well, so you can spend some on future features. Um, and that's where we get the spend, is where we get the permission to spend. Uh, if I look at our, I can just slap the timelines down and I can say, you know, here is your project timeline for the last four times that you've done it. Here's when you started, here's when you did code complete, here's when you shipped, and this whole time was fixing bugs, and this whole time, this time was adding customer value. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move code complete later so that I can decrease stabilization and move the ship date earlier. And that sells pretty well. Now, I get to do that because we have many, many projects and we've been doing them for many, many years. Um, at smaller companies, that can be very hard, and especially, you know, one company ago when I was working in a uh, tiny little startup plan, um, the answer was, I don't freaking care because if we don't get it out to market, we don't get to maintain anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Reasonable answer. <laughs> um, so uh, when we're when I'm at that level, um, then the biggest risk to a startup, to a small business, is uh, that I'm going to build the wrong thing. Right. Uh, it's that I'm going to spend a bunch of time build something, and the universe is going to uh, collectively say, "Who cares?" <laughs> right. um, so the way that we avoid that is. We build, measure, learn. We validate and learn. We go. We take a small iteration, um, and then we assess where we're going and whether the people care. And we find out the part that they care about, and we adapt and we improve our model and understanding of our customers. And as we improve our model, we're able to uh, make better and better guesses of what to build. Great, all goodness. Build, measure, learn. The thing that determines your the amount of validated learning you can get before you run out of money is the number of iterations you can go through. Because you can't really tell much, like the amount of information you gain per iteration is not that variable. You know, do the best, biggest experiment you possibly could, and you might gain twice as much information as a simple lightweight one. But the best, biggest one takes, you know, 100 times as long. So you just want to do that very, very quickly. So the thing that determines how fast you can learn, and therefore your business risk, is the speed with which you can take measurements. To take an assessment, I need to have a stable tool. I need to be able to measure and have that measurement mean something. UX design, if we go ask a bunch of UX designers about um, what is the determines uh, uh, behavior of humans when they're interacting with my code, um, there are a number of factors, um, and a lot of those are, you know, doesn't do what I want and that sort of stuff. But key of those is frustration or confusion. And in fact, the negative experience of frustration or confusion is more significant than the positive impacts if it does something useful and, and so on. If it does something useful but it's frustrating and confusing, people will route around it, they'll go the other way. And so if you've got an A-B test, it will strongly skew your results. Um, the, one of the best ways to get confusion or frustration is a small cosmetic bug. Right. So what this tells us is that if we want to actually do validated learning and really assess and get reasonable data, we need to be so bug free that we don't even have small cosmetic bugs so that our data means something. Otherwise, when you go and do an a, a split test, commonly your result is 4951. Like, it's not a big difference. If there's a cosmetic bug in there, there'll be 4951 the other way. If you've got a, pro a, a process that occasionally, one time in 20, produces a cosmetic bug that you don't know about, that means that when you run a bunch of experiments, all, you now have a bunch of data and you know that of this data, you know, 5% is completely uh, 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 incorrect, but you don't know which 5%. Right? That really screws up your ability to assess where your company should go, because you can no longer bet the company on a single first year of pivot. I actually have to run the experiment a couple of times. Well, now I just really blew up the cost of running this company. So again, if I'm doing a small sort of a startup, I need to be able to cycle fast, and I need to have very precise results, um, and that means I need to have I need to make sure that my bug rate is very, very low, which drives me to the same sustainability and maintainability argument. Thank you.
and you need to uh, get, collect metrics by mobile platform. <laughs> so that you know which one you screwed up in. You need to connect, collect all the metrics in all the places. Um, but yeah, so either way, um, there are two different arguments that really state that defects are deadly and far more deadly than people assume. Um, either that long-term maintainability prevents you, if you're a big company, from um, getting the development velocity that your competitors are and then they eat your lunch. Or if you're a small company, it prevents you from getting the data that you need to, to eat the lunch of those big guys. Yeah? Uh, I see you mentioned M-shaped people in there. I've heard of T-shaped before. It seems like M-shaped is a more intense version of uh, T-shaped. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, sure. whether everybody can become an M-shaped person and uh, it's hard to get there, what that means? Um, so becoming an M-shaped person, I'll first describe exactly what it is because I made up the term, so you know it's only gone as far as it's gone. Um, <laughs> um, and then I'll talk about how hard it is to get there. So uh, can, you, can you describe T-shaped for those of us who don't yeah, know? Yeah, T-shaped. Okay, so we'll start with. Um, so this is talking about specialists towards generalists. Right? So a specialist uh, or an I-shaped person um, is someone with one deep specialty. They look like the letter I. Right? Okay. A uh, uh, when you start working as a team, you do nothing other than that, but just work as a team so that we're starting to share uh, responsibility for work. And we might be working in each other's areas a little bit, uh, especially if we start actually sharing code responsibility and maybe we work together. Um, then you get T-shaped people almost for free. So they've got one deep specialty, and then all the other things that my pro company does, I get a little bit of ability. And so I've got this sort of broad top with some depth, and then one area of specialty. Um, you get that pretty much for free just by working together. Um, and the nice thing, when you've got I-shaped people, um, they have trouble communicating because they don't have overlap. And if you look at innovation and ask where innovation comes from, some innovation comes from going deeper in a specialty, um, but it's usually incremental. And the deeper your specialty, the higher the incremental cost of gaining depth. Right? It becomes a you know <laughs> asymptotic or, or logarithmic growth sort of thing. Um, innovation comes from someone taking an idea from one field, creatively misunderstanding and not quite getting it, and putting it in their field in a totally new and unique, bizarre way. Right? Um, <laughs> and so it really, it, it's you take those ideas from specialty A and apply them to specialty B, and that's what allows you to really increase depth rapidly. So if I have two I-shaped people on the team, I have no opportunity to do that, because they can't move an idea back and forth. They can't understand each other's domain. If I have two T-shaped people, then they can communicate, and I can take an idea that's deep in one specialty and sort of simplify it to the language that it can move across and they'll creatively misapply it. And actually you get quite a bit of, an, of creative misapplication and innovation happening that way. And it's great and companies love it. So M-shaped people is the next step. Find if you do not just that we do shared work and that we have shared code responsibility, um, but we actually work together all the time. You see this in teams that pair program 100% of the time um, or that mock work together. So, we, at that point, we don't just move explicit knowledge, we move tacit knowledge between people. And tacit knowledge is the secret to, to specialization. Um, once we've got that, then we actually find that people very rapidly develop multiple specialties, because the brain is really good at learning in parallel. Um, and so while the cost to learn a new, uh, the same specialty further uh, goes up as I get better, the cost to learn another specialty in parallel is pretty much the same. In fact, if you go ask around, um, who here thinks they're an M-shaped person? They have multiple deep specialties. Okay, two. Okay, great. Who here has something that you do at work, coding, testing, something at which you're a, special, a specialist? Something that you're good at at work? Management, something like that. Okay. Who here has a spouse with whom they communicate well, or a child with whom they can communicate and can get out to, to things on time, or a hobby that they do well, um, they dance, they sing, they do anything else like that. Who has one of those? Okay. Who just raised your hand more than once? You're an MJ person. <laughs> right? It's just that your business only required one of your specialties. Right? Um, so all we're talking about doing is that same M-shaped person that we already are, just develop multiple business specialties. And when we're in a structure in which we're all experiencing each other's tacit knowledge, 
that becomes fairly cheap and automatic. So, um, so the cost to become an M-shaped person if you don't have pairing in place or some other way of moving task knowledge is almost prohibitive. <laughs> really, really dang expensive. Um, but if you do have it in place, um, it becomes pretty much automatic. And the advantage of an M-shaped person, of course, is that now you can move ideas between two different domains within one brain, which means you have many more opportunities to make those hops and innovation goes faster. the domain in which you're trying to get the specialty. You know, the people who are involved have different specialties. Um, then you will all fairly quickly develop all of those set of specialties, whatever those are. Hopefully those are the ones you need. <laughs> um, if you've chosen the teams right. Um, and so, uh, for example, this is why a number of the XP teams that I, I worked with would hire consultants. Um, because we would run into a problem in which none of the 15 specialties that we had in each individual were the one that we needed. Because we hadn't run into this one before. So we would hire a consultant for two weeks, and he'd come in, and he was a specialist in, you know, who, what, who knows what it's going to be, in optimizing Hadoop. Um, and unlike normal vendors and consultants, we wouldn't have him go do some work for us. We'd come in, and he would work in a pair. We required that he did 100% of his work, either paired or mobbing with us. And the result was that inside of two months, not only had we fixed whatever this problem was, his specialty, all the rest of us were qualified to be consultants in that specialty. <laughs> And we didn't need the consultant anymore because we all had 16 specialties. <laughs> and we did that a lot. So we had a lot of specialists on, uh, specialists on the team. Last, last question. Just yeah. so. so going back to the cognitive load piece, yeah. this diagram at first glance gives me lots of I would agree, yeah. <laughs> It, it does not print out on a standard printer. So, do you think like the next iteration of this would be to try to? I think that would be great. I have not found a way really to simplify it without losing essential information. Um, so, the main <coughs> simplification that I do to it um, is I tell people work in these verticals. So, work vertically. So, first, traditional software done well. Well, you're probably already doing that. Don't worry about it too much. Second, work as a team. Do all the things that are necessary to work as a team. And there they are those five. Right? And there's a couple dependencies, but most of them are fairly straightforward. So do that, implement work as a team. Once you've got full fluency at that, not just you know, capability, but fluency at it, then core modern engineering. Right? Do all the things in core modern engineering that you can do in parallel. Um, so you can start sharing your work. You can start uh, understanding and optimizing systems and doing local transform based group factoring and do auto, doing automated developer testing. Right? Do all those. But don't really start on the later ones unless you're ready for it. You know, if you've got some ability to do local automated transform based group factoring, you might start great names. You know, if you're getting close to fluency, you might start it. But not until then. <laughs> right. So again, work through that set until you've got that set down cold. Then go on to adaptive engineering, leveraging the capabilities. Note, by the way, an interesting thing, all of the incremental planning stuff in my model appears here, leveraging capabilities. When I go in and, and help a team make a transformation, I don't change their planning and I don't do iterative-based planning at first. Okay, Agile Waterfall is my favorite uh, development method. Um, and it works really, really, really well. Um, the nice thing about starting with the technical practices is the technical practices work. They give you great results. Cognitive load goes down, it's easier to work together, the team gets to work together as a team, it's fun, T people are learning, capability goes up, bugs go down, life is good. That's wonderful whether you're doing waterfall planning or iterative planning or continuous form planning or who cares what. Changing the planning requires changing how management interacts with your team, and that's politically expensive. <laughs> right? So I'm gonna wait to do that until we've gotten good results. And furthermore, 
Changing the planning by itself doesn't actually give you much, much of a good result. If you take a team that does waterfall fairly well, and you say, great, we're going to go to iterations, and we're going to plan in terms of stories, we're going to do these short iterations, we're going to release the end of every iteration, and we're going to set our iteration cycle at two weeks, because that's what it says in the book, then they will totally fail to ship. And they will totally fail to ship for a number of iterations in which they're doing these planning sorts of things. Um, and then after their planning iterations are done, they'll start some coding iterations. Um, <laughs> in which they will totally fail to ship. <laughs> because they haven't changed the way they do the tech. And if you don't change the way that, it, that you do the tech, you can't work in the new way. The new work assumes that your tech is different. Software craftsmanship, the way that you code, is the heart of doing agility. And until you change the way that development happens, all the rest is just moving deck chairs. Once you change the way that you do tech, that's what enabled the lightweight development uh, uh, thing to happen back in, uh, you know, just before 2000. Um, they didn't change planning until they had people doing pair programming and factoring and retrospectives and stable teams and having those teams continually improve their, their way of doing development and good design and the rules of simple design. Those were all set in place. And then they went, wow, with all this stuff, I don't have technical dependencies anymore. I don't need to do the portion of my planning process that was there to deal with technical dependencies. Let's throw that away. And then, and I don't have this, these sources of technical risk, and I don't just keep piling up bugs, so I don't need all of this bug work down sorts of stuff. Let's throw that away. And these other technical risks, and I can throw away a lot of risk analysis because I've eliminated most of the risks. I don't need to figure out which ones to mitigate, I just fix them all. So that's where it's now useful to introduce iterative planning or continuous form planning because those can take advantage of a system that is working well in a way that waterfall can't. So that's when we change the way that we do planning. And so on and so forth. Well, having a map hang on, like Jeff, this, the Jeff? details fluids. Can you hang on, hang on just one second? <laughs> right. um, we, we'll, we'll have time for some more. Do you have time for more questions and answers? Yep. Yep. Okay. I just want to make sure that if anyone has a bus to catch or a parking meter or whatever, you've got to go. We understand that. We, we've kind of scheduled this till 8. So if you have to go, don't feel bad. We will miss you, but we will, get, we will carry on. Um, however, if you do feel like sticking around, Arlo's still going to answer some more questions. Uh, feel free to linger and chat and have a good time. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, Jeff, go ahead. Having a map like this is useful for putting these little bits of advice in context. Because often you hear advocates say, well, this is good. No, that is good. No, this goes first. But having a map that says, well, on what context, this is good advice. Helps. Yes. In fact, that was the reason that I first started creating it, was uh, people were asking about mocks. And I have this fairly strong no mocks position. Right? And I'm known for you know, being against mocks, basically, period. Um, and, but people were saying, but, but mocks are good, and they're critical in these situations. And I was like, OK, you're right. And the reason you're right is because when I say unit testing and when you say unit testing, we mean two totally different things. <laughs> right? um, and neither of us knows that. And so I started creating a map to identify, here are the various stages. And when you're in this stage, actually, mocks are absolutely essential because you don't know how to create units yet. And you do need to decompose so that you can start testing units, so that you can start getting the feedback that will teach you how to create units. <laughs> Once you learn how to create units, then I'll start eliminating dependencies. Now mocks get in the way of, and start decreasing the amount of design feedback you get, so you want to take them all out. But they were really useful for getting from here to here to here to there. And now they're in the way from here to here to here to here. So yes, totally agree. There's a lot of that advice that is completely contradictory depending on where you are in the graph. Yeah? Motivation versus the, the graph, yes, so it is at uh, bit.ly slash agile engineering stages. Um, and uh, I update it whenever I can. <laughs> so if you go look at it, um, each one of these um, you can click into and it has some amount of information and most of them currently look like that. <laughs> um, some of them have a lot more, you know, what it is, how it affects the team, um, the various mind shifts that are required, how you acquire the skill, how you attain fluency, how you measure proficiency, recipes that you can follow as you go, etc. So I'm trying to build out more, than, more and more of those. It's up on GitHub and I accept pull requests. 
Um, <laughs> otherwise, it will only happen at the rate that I can write them all. <laughs> but yes, so uh, go there. You can see it as it continues to evolve and as I continue to write. Um, and by all means, send me support requests. Um, Bitly Agile Engineering Stages, capital A, capital E, capital S. Upper camel case. Yep, upper camel case. So with a team that does sites um, in multiple countries, multiple browser support, and responsive, and you know I do like a lot of this stuff, we do TDD and everything, and it handles the .NET and the JavaScript. Do you have any suggestions on closing that bug churn when it comes down to HTML and CSS? <laughs> HTML and CSS are fun. Um, yeah, so, what are the sort of bugs that you're seeing? Because there's a bunch of different advice depending on what sort you're seeing. Uh, you fix a bug on one browser or one phone, and then it pops up somewhere else. You know, okay, so display differences between the various devices? Yeah. Okay, so um, I consistently make a particular set of choices that work almost all the time. Um, the place they don't work is if you need extremely high performance. Um, and that is, I use the libraries. I use Knockout or Angular or whatever to handle all of the display and all the browser unification um, so that I do get a consistent feel across all of them. And then I handle only from the view model back. Um, so I basically outsource that job. Um, that handles pretty much all of the cases. Um, and I find once in a while there will be a, a browser difference at that point, but they're really rare because that's part of the job of those libraries. Um, if I need ultra high performance on a particular platform that requires me to go all custom because I don't have time to deal with data binding, then I might have to do that. Um, but the times where I need to do that and my perf problem is within the my code executing doing DOM manip, not my model and not the underlying browser are pretty rare. <laughs> here, but could you repeat why you're against the mocks? Because <laughs> <laughs> they're evil. No. Uh, <laughs> Do you have a definition first? Yes. Yes, definition first. So, um, definition, uh, I'm going to use definition of test double. Anything that's a stand-in for the real thing when I'm testing it. So, I want to test something, I need to extract it from its normal context, and it has some dependencies, I need to provide something to replace that dependency in some way. So that's the overall test double definition. Then that gets broken down in a whole lot of different ways. Um, and mocks and stubs and, and uh, fakes and all sorts of things there. Now, I don't use all of those terms correctly. So when I'm using the word mock, typically what I'm meaning is pretty much any test double that isn't a no-op object. <laughs> so if it's null or the null object pattern, then I'll call it a test level um, because you call it and it explodes or it no ops. I'm okay with that. Anything that does anything more than that, I'll consider it to be a mock. Okay. And I consider all of those categories to be a problem. Um, so the reason, um, so the core, the core reason was, was simply was based on data and then I eventually found out why. Um, and that was when I was doing, um, for a while, my career was legacy code six. Um, I was a consultant, and I'd go into a really nasty legacy code, ship me your code, and I'll make it suck less. Okay. And um, I was doing some of those I could get build on time and material, but a lot of those I was on fixed bid. So I'm going to fix bid, make your project suck less, and implement a couple of features. This means I need to know a lot about what makes it more expensive for me to save a particular section of code. And I found that um, DI frameworks. Um, and mocks, if either of those were commonly used in the tests, um, I would have to double my bid in order to make profit. Um, it just made it more expensive to change and refactor. Aren't you afraid that you're generalizing from observed mature platforms in practice? Totally possible. <laughs> um, now, subsequently, I have found the things that I think led to that, and those I think are generalizable. Um, and, and hold true. If it were only the data, that would be completely possible, and I would be interested in what data other people have. Um, <laughs> as is, I'm sort of interested in what data other people have, but I've also heard similar from a number of other legacy code guys. Um, but the thing that I f was finding is that when people are using mocks that are more than just uh, a fake, 
um, then the specification for what a system should do happens in multiple places in the code. It happens in the test for that thing, and it happens in all the tests for other things for which that's a dependency. And it's very, very easy for those to fall out of sync with each other. And then when I'm working with legacy code, it's now my responsibility to ensure that those remain out of sync from each other in the same way as I change the design, because I need to maintain bug for bug compatibility. And that's a pain in the ass. <laughs> um, and secondarily, I find that when a team is using mocks, um, early on, when they don't know how to make units yet, um, they need to do that because they don't know how to really extract a concept. So when you talk about separation of concerns, their code has no separation of concerns, but it's because they have no concerns. Right? There are no actual concepts in the code to even be separated. Um, once they learn to have concerns in those concepts, then a lot of the interfaces and dependencies go way, way down. Um, and uh, at that point, then I switch, you know, before that, mocks are useful because we're just trying to break random, apart random pieces of code. After that, what I really want is to have clean, well-defined concepts that are mostly self-contained. And if a team is using mocks, they're no longer as able to get as good a feedback about when I've got three quarters of the concept here and one quarter hanging out somewhere else. It's a lot harder to see feature envy. It's a lot harder to see data envy and that sort of stuff. Um, and additionally, if I allow myself to use mocks to break things in the units for unit testing, mocks are a great tool in that they always work. I can always, it, it basically allows me to treat highly dependent code as if it were not dependent without having to change the design. Perfect for legacy, perfect for learning, a real problem when you're trying to get design feedback. As soon as I remove that tool, there's no other tool I have yet found that always works. All the others require you to actually change the design and re reduce the dependency and reduce the coupling. And there are a bajillion different ways to do that, and that's basically what all the design literature is about. Um, so by removing that one tool and, and calling it evil and beating the drum, what I'm really saying is now in order to solve the problems, you're going to have to actually solve them. You're going to get feedback about when they occur. And to solve each one, you're going to need to go learn the right part about design that helps you to actually solve that problem. And so while I don't think mocks are evil um, in truth, and I use them all the time when I'm working with legacy code, um, by holding myself to the standard of saying mocks are evil, then I continue to refine and improve my design practice over time. Um, and I introduce them into legacy code only until I can actually tear out the concept and then I can remove them. Okay, uh, real quick, hey guys. So it's uh, almost 8.30. Uh, parking garage downstairs closes at nine. So we need to kind of wrap up. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to get you all to stand up and start putting some chairs away. Uh, if you want to still chat a little bit, that's fine, but uh, get out. <laughs> All right, hey, so let's give our other hands. Thank you. And thank you guys for being here tonight.